Um, now, when I was when I was 16, I did my GCSEs and I, I did okay. I got I got um, seven C's, a D and an E. So by no means was I setting the world alight. Um, but I got my GCSE results. And my parents said, "So what are you going to do now?" And I said, "I'm going to play professional football." Um, that is what I wanted to do. That's all I was interested in. That's um, the only thing um, that I was passionate about. And my parents said, okay, so until that happens, what are you going to do? And I said, you know what, I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't really got a clue. Um, and they said, well, why don't you go to college and study computers? Because when I was 16, computers was the thing to be when you grow up. It was the future. <laughs> So off I went to college in Park Lane, which is just around the corner from here, and got um, an advanced GNVQ in IT, and then at 18, still not playing professional football, went to Sunderland University and got a degree in computing. And at 21, um, I again came home, um, not playing football, I opened the Yorkshire Post and there was an advert for a job in IT for graduates with the Halifax Bank. Um, and I applied for that, was successful in that, and joined the Halifax, doing computing. Now, um, at 24, um, 24 my, my, my wife um, had been my girlfriend since she was 15. She sat behind me in French at school and we'd, um, we'd gone through school together, we'd gone through college and university, and we'd bought a house and got married, and for the first time in our lives at 24, we had a little bit of money and decided we were going to go on a really nice holiday. Couldn't decide where we were going to go. We were looking at places like Peru and Borneo and incredible places like that. And in the end, decided we were going to go to Kenya and Tanzania. And we were we went to go and see animals. And we went to go and lay on a beach. That's the reason that we went. I knew nothing about Africa, apart from what you see on the television and what you see on the news. Um, knew nothing about it. Had no real interest in it, but just wanted to go and see this um, this incredible place. And before I went, one of my friends who'd been on honeymoon the year before, he said, when you go to Africa, when you go to Kenya, he said, make sure you take pencils. Because apparently in Africa, kids love pencils. So, one well, lunchtime before I went, I went to the pound shop in Halifax, bought 100 pencils for a pound, and put them in my suitcase, and off I went. Now, on those types of holidays, when you spend a lot of money on a holiday like that, you get so well looked after that you never get an opportunity to meet real people. You get picked up from the airport, get taken to your hotel room, you get picked up from your hotel room in the morning, have a lovely breakfast and then taken out into a game reserve and then back to your hotel and never ch get the chance to meet real people apart from hotel staff. Now every single day that we were there however, our car broke down. So we would be driving along, the car would stop, the driver would casually get out of the car, walk around, lift the bonnet and kick the car and hit the car and casually lower the bonnet and off you would drive again. And every day I'd say, is everything alright? And he'd, he'd turn around and say, yeah, everything's fine. So, no problems. As we were leaving Tanzania, we were leaving Tanzania to go to Kenya to get a flight, uh, to get a flight back. And same routine happens. We're driving down a long road, car stops, driver gets out, lifts the bonnet, kicks the car, hits the car, closes the bonnet, gets in the car and turns around and he said, I'm really sorry, the car's broken. Um, you're stuck. Um, he said, you've missed your flight, you're going to be two or three hours before somebody's coming. Somebody is coming, we'll sort out your flights, don't worry about it, but you, you're stuck. Now when we were there, um, a little boy came walking down the road, and we had been there a while, and it was a long straight road, there was nothing around, there was no houses, there was nothing, there was very little traffic coming. But then I saw this little boy walking down in the distance, and I said to my wife, Wayne, quick grab those pencils, there's a boy coming. The first child that we'd ever really had the opportunity to interact with. So he came, um, and I remember him now, he, he first of all, um, we started walking towards him with a handful of pencils, and he turned and ran, and the driver shouted to him, and he, he obviously, I don't know what he said, but it was obviously, you're safe, and he, the boy turned around and walked back, and my wife handed him the pencils, and he stood in front of us and put his head down and bowed, and I was completely blown away, I'd never seen anything like it in my life, I'd never seen gratitude like it. Something so small, it was three, four pence worth of pencils, and the gratitude, just incredible, and completely blew me away, really bothered me. And I came home, did some research, and found out at that time that 46 million children in Africa were not going to school. 46 million. 90 million children worldwide, hundreds of millions of people illiterate around the world because they'd never set foot in a classroom before. Now, for children, who would not set foot in a classroom before, whilst there are primary schools in a lot of countries 
it's free to a point. It's free if you can get there. If there's a school nearby, it's free if you can take your uniform, and it's free if you can take your equipment. So through something so small, through putting pencils in the hands of that boy, meant that he could go to school. And that, for me, sort of unlocked that child's potential. I'd never seen anything as simple as putting pencils in the hands of somebody and really transforming the direction of their life. And I thought, that's amazing. That's what I want to do. I want to buy pencils and put them in hands of kids who want to go to school. It's really simple. So every lunchtime, before we all had the internet on our phones and the internet was readily available, um, we had an internet cafe at work and every lunchtime I would go down to the internet cafe and write to charities and phone charities and research pencils, Kids Africa. And everyone who I wrote to, I told the story to and I said, so this is what I want to do, I want to buy pencils and send them to kids. And they all wrote back and went, that's brilliant, but give us the money and we'll do it. And I was going, no, 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 you don't get it. I'm not going to give you the money. I am going to buy pencils because I know that is what the children want. And nobody would allow me to do what I wanted. Nobody would allow me to help in the way that I wanted. People only wanted money. Now, after months of trying, I finally found a charity in the States um, that doesn't exist anymore, but it was helping a handful of Maasai children to go to secondary school. I think it was about three or four children that they were helping at the time. I again told them the same story and they went brilliant. We know a lady in the south of, um, of Kenya, she'd been educated herself um, and she's come home, it's, there's a drought, it's not rained in four years, all the animals are dead and Maasai people are, tr uh, are, are farmers and that's what they know. They don't know anything else apart from farming and she's come home and said, I, I don't know what the future holds because the animals are dead and we're all looking around and going, so what do we do now? So she decided, as a woman, um, that she was going to start a school. She put 14 walls, she had a job um, working locally, and she was able to, out of her own pocket, put up 14 walls. Now, she was struggling to run that school. She couldn't afford the equipment to run it. So for me, it was a perfect fit. So I was able to say, tell me what you want. I'll buy you the pencils, I'll buy you the rulers, I'll buy you the stationary equipment that you need to run this school. So... Again, I, I, I got this lady's email address, uh, went to the pound shop, put all the items in a jiffy bag and put them, took them to the Royal Mail, wondering whether I would ever see them again or how they would get there. Um, but three weeks later, I got an email of the lady with five children holding the pencils that I bought, the exact thing that I bought. So it wasn't a, a donation that sort of went into the ether. It was, a, it was something that I knew I had bought and that ended in the hands of the people who I knew were going to benefit from them. Now this went on for about a year, so I, my friends saw it, my work colleagues saw it, and they went, that's great, you know, we've got, I'll give you £5 every month, and, and, and people would open the drawer at work and go, there's loads of stuff here, take that. Um, and, and it helped um, me for a year go and send the items to this small school, 14 walls, helping five children to go to school. Now after a year I went on an incredible course in work called Unlocking Potential, and this course talks about people like Bob Geldof and James Dyson and famous people who believed in themselves but very ordinary people as well, not just famous people, very ordinary people who had their own stories, who believed in themselves even though people said you can't do, they believed in themselves that they could make a difference. And I walked out of that course in Bradford and sat in the car and phoned the lady in Kenya and, and I said, so what's, what's the dream? And she said, my dream is I'll have a school for 420 children. And I said, I'll help you do that, and put the phone down and thought, I've got no idea how to do that. Um, I've never raised a penny in my life, I've never done a bake sale, I've never collected a penny, but I've just promised a woman I've never met before who lives thousands of miles away, I'm going to build her a school. And I thought, how do people, how do people fundraise? And um, I thought, people, people cycle. Um, I, I could cycle somewhere, I'll, I'll cycle from Land's End to John O'Groats, because I'm sure that can't be that hard, and I'll, I can do that. Um, so I started telling people, I started telling my boss, and my boss said, I'll do it with you. Um, and and we, so we said we were going to do it, and then people started sponsoring, and we had a sponsorship form. I thought, I'd better train for this. Um, and I lived two miles out of Homeforth, and got on my bike, and I tried to cycle to Homeforth, and I had to get off my bike halfway down. Um, because cycling as an adult isn't as easy as it was when you're a child. And the roads that you drive down every day that you think are flat actually have hills in them. <laughs> um, so um, I... I trained, and I trained for nine months, and ended up cycling a thousand miles in eight days, um, and, registered, and, and raised fifteen thousand pounds, which enabled me to then register my charity. Now, what I did 
I said to that community, what we'll do is we will build a classroom every year. So the children that are there now, at the end of the year, we will move up to the next year. I'll build you another classroom and we'll bring in new four and five year olds and we'll grow on a one classroom per year model so that we can make sure that we are growing the school at a steady pace. We're not bringing children into education who can't cope with it because they've never been in the education system before. We will do it at a slow pace. It's the first time that they're doing it. I've never done anything like this before. But we'll, we'll give this a go and we're going to try our very best to provide quality education. Now, whenever you do anything, whenever you do a marathon or whenever you do anything like cycling land centre John and Groats, you always get asked two questions. And for me, I first day back in work, I, I was down in Halifax and I got in early to, I could check my emails and walked back into work and there was one other person and, and he said, how was the bike ride? He asked me the first question, how was the bike ride? Tell me about it. And I said it was fine, it was, it was good, it was hard on the first day, it was hard on the last day. My bum's really sore um, and I've got sores all over me but do you know what, it was, it was okay. And then I got asked the second question and he said, so what's next? What are you going to do? How are you going to surpass yourself? And I said, Rob, do you know what, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. And he started laughing and he said, are you going to cycle to Africa? And I turned around and looked at my computer and looked at the map and realised from my house to Africa it was a straight line down. I said, yeah, that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to cycle to Africa. I'm going to show that Africa is not a million miles away, it's not a place, it's not a place that we should be dismissing, it's a place that's on our doorstep. And I'm going to cycle from my doorstep to Africa to show that. So with two friends, I then cycled to Africa um, and cycled 1,800 miles in um, 14 days. Um, and we raised £85,000 as a result of that. Now, the work that we've done at Mamusa, the, 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 the charity that I've registered, we feed the kids um, so the parents don't need to worry about it. We clothe the kids so we provide their uniforms. We provide um, all the materials that they need in school. We build the classrooms. Um, we provide malaria nets. We provide free healthcare. Um, we work in the community on um, sustainability projects and employ employment projects. Um, I employ the teachers. I give the teachers free houses. I build houses for the teachers so I can provide the very best. And I've done um, I've done events all all over the world now, and I've had I've had people who've, who've cycled with me in lots of different places all over the world. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into the details of of what the last ten years have brought. But one of the things that that people always say to me is, why do you do it? Why do you why do you help? people who you've never met before, um, why don't you um, just get on with your life and, 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 do, and, and in, enjoy that? And it's a really difficult thing to explain. And a year ago, um, I, had, I, I, I started taking uh, volunteers out two, three years ago now, who are the most incredible people who selflessly, again, give their time and come out. And Richard Branson said, um, take your kids into the world, it's the greatest classroom they will ever have. Now, I've got a thousand children who I look after now who I can't take into the world. Their parents can't afford to take them into the world, so I run volunteering trips to bring the world to children to provide, enhance the quality education that we've got. And I get people to bring their skills. And I had um, a young man who said to me, what can I do? And I said, tell me about you, tell me about what you do. And he said, I, I like to make films. I, 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 I'm a filmmaker. And I said, brilliant. So your job in the next week is to get to know me and get to know the kids and, and I want you to tell um, a story about Mamusi um, in a couple of minutes. So I'm just going to um, show you this film now. I left on the streets in the 
Whilst that video was filmed by a brilliant young man, um, that was written by the kids. So every child that you saw there speaking actually wrote that. Um, they sat down and we asked them questions. So the guy who, who made the film said, what's your hopes, what's your dreams, what's your fears? What do you want in life? And that is their story. He's then pulled it all together, um, which I think is incredible. And, and you know, every child deserves to dream. Every child should want to be an engineer, um, an accountant, an astronaut. And you know, for me, I want children to dream and, and I'll build the schools that help them fulfill that and help them go to school. That was my first school. Um, we've now got 360 kids um, at that school. Um, we are the top performing school in that district, um, um, surpassing every other school, apart from there's, there's one private school that's managed by Tata, which is an incredible private school um, that is doing phenomenally well, but we are right there at the very top, because for me it's not just about education, it's about quality. I wouldn't be doing it if, it, if I just thought, well, the kids can just go to school. Kids deserve the very, very best, and that's what I'm trying to do. Um, we've also got to, I've also got two more schools, um, uh, another one in Kenya um, and another one in Tanzania. Um, I'm about to start my fourth and fund a fifth as well. Um, so, you know, from an accident um, or a chance encounter, and fortunately in a car that wasn't so good, um, you know, my life's gone from going this way to that way. There's nothing special about me at all. Um, I just have an opportunity to help and, and direct people, hopefully in the right way, and hopefully those kids. And in fact, I do know those kids. Um, are all going to come back and do amazing things and hopefully will be the next presidents, prime ministers who will um, change the direction of the future for their families and for their, um, for their countries as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Right, is the, uh, so you said you, the brave place you on that second, mm. the one way you cycled from home to Africa. Yeah. How long ago was that? Uh, that was five years ago. And you raised 85, so you must have raised a lot more since. So I've raised a lot more since. How, how have you been doing that? Um, it has been primarily through cycling um, that I've done that. Um, I did an event for Save the Children as well, um, where um, I had people, we had thousand people all over the world cycling. Um, I had a bike on the London Eye and pe uh, pedalled on there for 24 hours as well um, and that raised £420,000 um, as well. So you know for me what I... What I um, How are you getting it out there? Who are the people? Are? Is, it, is it companies? Is it, uh, do you know people or celebrities backing you? Or what? No, no, it's just amazing people who um, who wants to donate? We've got my um, second school that we've got in, in Kenya is corporate sponsored. Um, uh, it's a company who wanted to have a long term relationship, um, and for them, not only do they fund a classroom every year, in fact, we're building a school for 700 kids, they're building two classrooms every year and everything that goes with that, but taking volunteers out as well. Okay. So for them, it's a, it's a big um, commitment and a big package. But then, at the same time, like I said, you know, for me, it was about me going and doing things and people sponsoring me, but I was at the point of thinking, what do I do? You know, I've, people always expect to surpass yourself. You know, I'm gonna cycle America and to Russia and then I'll go around the world and then what? When I when I've done that and I'm going back to the same people and going, Do you remember that school I started? Will you sponsor me? So, you know, for me not only is taking people out to, to Africa, um, 
a good thing. You know, the vast majority of those people are coming back as well and going, you know what, I want to help because I know exactly the people who I'm helping and they're having their own journeys, they're having their own accident at the side of the road and meeting those people who they want to help. So.